So Claudine, um, if somebody does not have a path CR to um, preoperative therapy with the triple negative, which unfortunately is still quite common in the 50, 40, 50% range, even with you know, the best therapy we have, what, um, what do you do with those patients? Well, I think as Tiffany said earlier, we know that that is a high risk group of patients. So, so we obviously have the data from PCR from lots of different trials, uh, but one of the other interesting presentations at San Antonio was a presentation from the ISPY2 trial looking at the event-free survival. So looking at a solid outcome in terms of, of what happened to the patients and really validating what I think we're, we're increasingly believing that achieving a pass CR makes a huge difference. And across, this was across different drugs because the ISPY2 was looking at different targeted therapies for, for different subtypes of breast cancer. For patients who achieved pass CR, the event-free survival was about 94 to 96%, regardless of what group they were in, regardless of what drug they, they got, that the event-free survival was in the high 90s or the mid 90s for those patients at three years. And that's a high-risk group of patients that that trial selects for a high-risk group of patients. Whereas if they didn't achieve a pass CR, you were looking at, again, the numbers varied. So for patients with triple negative, it was more like 65, 69% event-free survival at three years and a little bit better for the hormone receptor positives, but really distinguishing those groups. So I think, as Tiffany says, that really the neoadjuvant setting allows us to triage our patients. And, and I think the thing that we're all hoping for our patients is they get a pass CR, but uh, we also realize that this is where we need novel therapies and this is where we need something else. So that area is very uh, rich now in terms of clinical trials, but we also have some data. So the data from the CREATEX trial was, was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that looked at the role of capecitabine in patients who, again, it was HER2 negative, so it included triple negative, but also hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients who did not achieve a, a past CR or had node positive disease. And it randomized them to either get uh, capecitabine for six to eight cycles or no further therapy. And uh, I think somewhat surprisingly to many of us showed an improvement in outcome in the patients who got the Cape side bean. Um, it wasn't an easy regimen. You know, a lot of patients were not able to complete it on the dose or somewhere around a quarter of patients actually stopped early um, and did not complete all their intended cycles. But there was an event free and overall all survival benefit that was particularly marked in the triple negative subset. Um, so I think that has really become something that we think of and I would think of as uh, what we have the highest level of evidence for in terms of what to do in a patient who does not achieve a pass CR. I think we're also grappling with in those patients who didn't get a platinum, should we be incorporating a platinum? Should we be thinking of immunotherapy, checkpoint inhibitor therapy in, in those patients? Should we be thinking of some sort of combinations? And again, there are a number of large intergroup trials that are addressing some of those questions. Yeah, and the, they did use the, the um, label dose of the Cape Cytobine mm -hmm. there, which I always have to remind myself of that because I don't start ever with that, right. but I do right. think the onus is on us is to push the dose as much as we can, like maybe starting mm -hmm. with the two grams per meter, you know, mm -hmm. um, and divided doses, 14, seven, and, and get as much as we can in because that disease-free and overall survival benefit was had with a very, very high dose. And it wasn't even tolerable for some patients. I, I do think the other point, and th this was a trial that was done in an Asian population. There's mm -hmm. a lot of debate and a lot of differences between what we see in terms of, of tolerability and efficacy with some drugs uh, in the Asian population compared to the non-Asian population. So we really don't know how that translates to the population that we might be seeing more commonly in our clinics. Yeah. And I, um, you know, your, your point about the fact that the whole trial was positive, meaning the ER positive was there mm -hmm. too. The point estimate wasn't as impressive in the ER positive, but it was like around the 0.83 or mm -hmm. something. And I, I'll just um, point out that we did look at, we did one of the negative mm -hmm. adjuvant, right. you know, Cape Cytobine <laughs> trials, <laughs> one of the several, unfortunately, <laughs> when you're just adding it into everybody without a selected right. high right. risk subset, right. you see. It's so enriched. But we did um, central key 67, centrally done key 67, and showed in a, in a um, hypothesis generating subset analysis that it was the higher higher key 67 patients, 20% um, or, or more, that really had a, a, a larger benefit from adjuvant Cape Cytobine than, than not. In my own practice, from a practical standpoint, someone gets preoperative, um, the ER positive, and they have a residual disease, but the key 67 is, you know, less than 10%. Personally, I'm not adding in the Cape Cytobine to those patients, but they still have some proliferation on them, and I don't think the, the cut point, is, we couldn't say, but they still got some proliferation on them, then I am using the CREATEX data. That's what I'm doing from a practical standpoint mm -hmm. in my, how about you, Tiffany, using much in ER positive? 
So I also try to risk stratify there. Folks who end up with a large burden of nodal disease, even despite best. Now, another point on Createx, the vast majority of those patients did have anthracycline taxane-based neoadjuvant mm -hmm. regimen, sort of high 90% uh, received that. So with a high risk residual disease, I am inclined to offer it even in my ER positive patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in that group as well, the other thing we're grappling with is the role of improving our endocrine therapy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of mm -hmm. trials that are addressing mm -hmm. that, the addition of CDK4-6 right. inhibitors as options for those right. patients within the setting of clinical trials, or the role of more of ovarian suppression or adding other things uh, on top of that, how that might further improve outcome in, in that group of patients. Yeah. And actually, to mm -hmm. a logistical question, which wasn't quite clear from the manuscript, is what do we do about our ER positive patients who also need to get onto their adjuvant endocrine therapy, yeah. may need postmastectomy radiation or, or radiation in and of itself with breast conservation. Um, and I don't know that we have much guidance from what's been published. I, I could say in, in my practice, we do go right on to radiation and get that done. And I've been overlapping my endocrine therapy with my adjuvant cape cytobine mm. because mm. I would hate to delay starting mm. that mm. for six months or yeah. longer because of the radiation time. Yeah, I actually I emailed uh, uh, Professor Masuda to ask, <laughs> and they, they gave the um, radiation first, and yeah. then they gave the cape cytobine. But you're right, you got to get your endocrine therapy right. going. It gets tricky on mm -hmm. these CDK4 6 mm -hmm. trials because there's only a certain amount of endocrine that you can get before they have to be randomized. Right. So it is is a little uh, tricky, but cape cytobine yeah. really has come into the in, into the forefront. I think yeah. for that for the high risk no path CR uh, patients.